not a Thursday night decision maker or, or difference maker, but continuous jib sheets are really useful so that when you're out on the rail, it's much easier to be able to make those lured sheet adjustments without having to leave the rail. The non-continuous sheet that's difficult to do. It means that you can always banjo from either side. And then up here at the clue end, instead of having these clue blocks that are tied in, there are independent clue blocks that have little pennants that have dog bones on them. So if you need to do a jib change or you need to make some sort of adjustment up here, you don't have to unreave the whole system to make it happen. It's slick and it's nice. And at the end of the day, it also dramatically reduces the time it takes to take sails down, get them furled up. Your jib sheeting situation so that what we're doing is we're connecting back here. The jib sheet will have an eye splice in the end of it. And then we connect it with a form of a soft shackle here. That's going to give you much higher levels of calibration on your jib sheet for both your windward and leeward or active jib sheet. So instead of these knots, every time you put the jib up and down, first of all, we strip the jib sheet for the forward portion. The jib sheet diameter goes down and there's an eye splice in the end. And what that'll do is allow us to have much more accurate uh, trim marks. We want to have a calibrated position for your leeward side sheet and your windward side sheet so that when we come out of attack, we always know we're going to six and four. Put a button shackle right here, soft shackle through the eye. Right now, every time you retie this knot, it's going to be different. A jib halyard tensioner. Uh, one, we're allowed to increase the purchase from the original purchase that is here. Uh, to give you a little more control and more accuracy over your jib halyard tension, which is really important. And in particular with the J6 jib, very important. Um, and so that, that generally has been upgraded. The, uh, some boats with the original rig have actually upgraded that to separate the main halyard to the starboard side and the jib halyard to the port um, because modern rigs have them separated. S-hook can be a spinnaker uh, eater. So because we recover the spinnaker through the lower V, that S-hook tends to grab the spinnaker on the way in. Um, and so most of us have replaced that S-hook with some other form, either a shackle or a dog bone. It's literally a square bar that's about four inches long that keep the, the rig at a fixed point and holds these just like that so that they can't do the quarter turn. I know it seems silly that a quarter turn, which is a millimeter of change would matter, but it does. And it, it means that your matrix gets messy if you can't fix something in the system, right? Out on the cabin top to give you a better routing for the, the vane cleats. I wouldn't call any of these things that I'm suggesting essential, but I'm just pointing them out as, as things that are, are worthy of consideration. Method of tensioning the backstay is the original idea that came from J-Boats. It's a nifty idea, but one that when you get the backstay tight enough is very difficult to ever get undone. So almost everybody has gone away from that. The simplest way to do it is to just pull the ball off the end and undo the Chinese finger trap and put a trucker's hitch in back there. That will allow you to get your gross tune set the way you want. So when we tune the boat, you want the backstay to be 100% eased so that there's no influence from the backstay or the main halyard as you're tuning the rig because it's very easy to throw off your tuning with either of those controls on. Um, and then once you have got the, the boat set up to your base tune, then you start to pull on gross tune. So you would undo this overhand knot in this case, I would probably just cut it. And then you would pull the splice out. You would tie in a trucker's head here. That allows you to get the tension that you need in your backstay. Right now, your backstay is spending 90% of its time taking out the slack in the backstay. But what you want is as soon as you tension the backstay, it should be bending the rig. And you want to set it so in any given condition, that's the situation. So in very heavy air, obviously you have to tension it a lot because um, the head stays pulling the rig forward. Uh, and in light air, it doesn't need to be that much, but you want, it, you want to be able to get so that 
at the 50% mark on your backstay tension, that is roughly your average max tension. The reason for that is, is we never wanna be 100% out and we never wanna be 100% into the backstay because we're out of range if that's the case. So we always wanna be playing in that 50% zone. And in order to do that, you need a simpler but more sophisticated tensioning system for the gross tune of your backstay. So all I did was pull the splice out. And now I'm tying in a trucker's hitch. So that's a slippery overhand knot. And now, very quickly, we can get backstay tension. Whereas before it was super loose. So I'm just gonna throw this up like that. Now when you pull your backstay on, the second you apply backstay tension, oh. mass is bending. You should never get to even here on the backstay, right? And so now your range is so much more accurate and refined up at the top of the range just by taking that out. The next thing that you might consider is that the upper leg of the backstay, there's no class legal limit on how long it must be. So most of us have shortened it by about 36 to 48 inches. By making that leg shorter and making the V portion of the backstay longer, we've dramatically improved the effectiveness of the backstay. And um, the backstay is a pretty important and powerful control on this boat because headstay sag has a dramatic impact on upwind performance. That'll make a, a big difference in your backstay control. The jib sheets, the jib halyard, the main halyard, the main sheet, the spinnaker sheets, the Cunningham, all of those things need calibration and it needs to be fairly fine tuned calibration because the step from one to two can't be two inches. It needs to be a half an inch and we need to be able to work in those types of half an inch increments. So the first thing is, is that we just need to put the marks down. Okay. So, and, and we can do that on a no wind day or on a, you know, on a day we're not sailing. It's very easy to come down as a team and mark up the boat. We're going to have scales, obviously, for each of the jib trek marks, the traveler marks. We're going to have the jib sheets. They're going to need to stay fixed where they are. And then we will deploy the jib and figure out what our max trim potential is. Even before we're sailing, we know that no mark should be past that. And then we'll try to put our trim marks in the middle of the range. Um, the halyards all need to be marked so that we can have the adjustment there. Um, and those are, they'll start with tape marks, they'll go to Sharpie, and then finally they get whipped when we're convinced that's the, the spot they should be in. That you know is fast, and then from there you can experiment. But you got to be able to get back to first gear, if you will, or that home base. So everything needs to be automatically marked so that when we come out of attack we know that our first gear speed advance is six on the leeward sheet four on the windward and then when we're go final trim it's six and a half units on the on the leeward sheet and it's seven units on the on the windward or what whatever that may be we then take that data and we plug it into a matrix so when we go out and go sailing and we go it's 11 knots tonight this is our starting point we know home base um, that gets us on the on the front line very quickly and then we'll make some small adjustments from there a half a unit here a half a unit there um, on my j111 for instance we can work in half inch increments and not feel a huge penalty but in this boat that is not the case um, there's just it, it's it's too delicate of a boat and the boat is incredibly heel sensitive um, in fact heel is kind of the final arbiter of whether or not you're set up right. <laughs> Some of that is uh, keel specific because not all the keels are the same, but I would say 12 is average. There are some boats that actually will sail with a little more heel than that, um, but but call 12 the average. You know, that's the, if you were to look at the equation, the solution has a heel number degree next to it, more so than a boat speed number or anything else. We okay. need to be at that heel number and the best boats out there it looks like the boat is somehow stuck on a rail as every puff or lull comes through somehow the heel angle never changes and that's because there's like an octopus of people in here doing a million things so that the boat doesn't change that angle of heel there's sail changes there's body weight changes there's whatever it takes to maintain that angle of heel the high aspect 
ratio nature of the keel means that if it does this, even just a few degrees, it tends to lose its attachment pretty quickly and then the boat goes sideways. And downwind, um, you know, J boats are notorious for loving windward heel. J24s love windward heel, J22s, J80s love windward heel, J105s love windward heel. <laughs> but then when we stepped into this more modern design, you know, the J70, the J111 are basically the same boat on a CAD file, just scaled up and down. There we found out that the boats like to sail flat or even with five to eight degrees of leeward heel um, and need to be pressurized and kept moving mm -hmm. until we get into this middle of the road range where we sail wing on wing. And both 70s and 111s love to be on the wing between nine and 14 knots. Um, and then as soon as we get to 14, we should be on the step and, and boogieing again. Um, and so there becomes a question of moding. What mode should I be in? What should the boat feel like in that mode? And who goes where in that mode? And it becomes um, formulaic to some degree, uh, but you have to nail the formula. You have to, you know, kind of believe in it and, and run with it. Then after that, it really becomes uh, a boat handling game. The cool thing about boat handling on this boat is, is that with some fundamental understanding of order, like what happens in what order, the boat handling problems disappear. So we get all that stuff out of the way. If you're having a boat handling problem, you'll never be in the top half. Um, but we should be able to eliminate all boat handling problems throughout the, the wind velocity range very quickly because the boat's pretty easy to sail. It's very difficult to sail well, it's very easy to sail. So we get that stuff out of the way. Mostly that's process um, that we get everybody on board with. Everybody knows their job. Everybody has a job at every moment as we sail around the race course. And if they stay in their lane and they do their job, you pass a ton of boats. As soon as people start lane crossing, they go to the back. There are four essential roles on the boat. So you can sail the boat with two competitively, or you can sail the boat with six competitively, but the boat's most naturally sailed with four. Well, so total weight, is one consideration, but weight distribution is the next one. So because we need to have two people legs in and two people legs out, if you could put 450 on the rail and 300 legs in, that would be ideal, right? So you kind of think about roles and responsibilities based around that, uh, that concept. And your forward crew member uh, is, you know, that bow position, but they're oftentimes the spinnaker trimmer. So that's the, the role that your, your biggest guy often plays. We want to put them as far forward as possible because that's the widest part of the boat. We're not really allowed to hike forward of the shrouds, at least not outboard. You can have your legs forward of the shrouds, but you can't actually physically be out there. So if your biggest person is at that forward stanchion, they are putting their maximum riding moment into the boat. They are in charge of environment. So they are looking upwind on the, on the weather leg and helping paint the picture of what's gonna happen in the next 60 seconds. Um, they're generally informing your strategist and tactician, your mainsail trimmer, on whether or not you're on the correct side of the course. They're helping count boats to some degree, but they're, they're really focused on that environmental picture of what will happen next. Your forward crew member physically is um, there to, to hike and they have four positions that they're likely to be in. So they have a full hike position, they have a legs in position, they have a tank commander position, and then they have a lured legs forward position. None of them are comfortable. So you need a big guy who's also flexible. <laughs> um, uh, and, and they need to be aggressive in their physicality, like football, summer, two a day practice level physicality. Um, that will make a huge difference. Uh, um, then your next crew member back, that's usually going to be your jib trimmer. They have uh, a cerebral responsibility of uh, giving the relative performance of our boat to our nearest windward neighbor. Um, and so obviously we want to be doing same angle, same speed at a minimum, uh, and ideally higher and faster whenever we can. And so they're working on that. They're giving that, that painting that picture of relative performance and then giving a value statement about it. So maybe we are higher, slower, but net gain to us because we're working to the next puff or maybe we're lower, faster, but we're moving out and getting our nose clean 
again, net gain to us. So they're, they're giving both a, a painting the picture, a, val, a, a statement, and then a value statement on top of it. The jib trimmer's got a pretty interesting role. They need to be the most agile person on the boat so that they are the first person off the rail to help manage heel with body weight. Um, and they need to be able to trim the main, uh, the, the leeward sheet and the windward sheet or the active sheet and the windward sheet in concert with one another, right? Because it's a circuit. So if, in this boat, if you ease the active sheet, the top is twisting open because of the high aspect ratio of the jib very quickly. You'll lose the top with even a half an inch of jibbies. So generally, whatever you give away on active, you need to take in on windward. And then consequently, if you're trimming in the active, sometimes you have to ease the windward to make sure that you're not closing the top of the jib. Then the jib halyard has a huge impact on the whole profile of the jib. And that needs to be moving as well. But if you move that, then the other two have to move too. So that person needs to be really willing to keep working at it. Um, and it's a very physical job if you're doing it well, probably more so in light air than in, phys in, in heavy air, um, because you need to be both in and out of the boat regularly. Um, and the, the profile of the jib changes so much as the velocity changes through the middle of the range. Then you've got your mainsail trimmer, who is, you know, has, they're kind of the central computer of the boat. So from a cerebral standpoint, they are processing the speed and relative information, the balance of the boat, and, uh, and, and just kind of trying to keep the whole team together. They're making the final decision on what we do next. They are head on a swivel, um, and they are the heel minder as well, because they have the principal heel control. So, and they have so many levers that they can pull to get the boat to the correct angle of heel. And that person needs to be remarkably accurate. And the mainsail trimmer needs to be somebody who is never satisfied. Good enough is neither good nor enough. Um, as soon as they think they've got it right, they need to recognize where that position is and then experiment around it. And if they fall off the cliff, get back to what was right. And they have to be able to process that at a very high baud rate. They have, to, they have to be able to run those cycles very, very quickly. The mainsail trimmer is experimenting, you know, working very hard to get it right. Um, the main sheet is the principal control, but all of the secondary controls of backstay, Cunningham, outhaul, those things need to be moving on the regular. There's not a single set it and forget it control on this boat. Um, and then you've got your helms person who's extremely focused from a cerebral standpoint on boat speed and angle of heel. Um, and so, you know, they don't have a string in their hand, so they have to drive the heel. Um, and if the boat starts to tip over, they've got to push the tiller. And in a J70, it's a really weird feeling for a helms person, but you probably spend 60% of your time pushing rather than pulling. If you're pulling, something's way out of whack and you need to use your mouth, not your muscles to communicate that to the team. Um, in a perfect world, the helm is neutral uh, all the time. Don't let the boat tip over. Even if you break the jib up, like the, the full front 12 inches of the jib is inside out, you gotta push the boat. And the amount of focus that's required uh, means that the elite level of the J70 world is reserved for savants and Asperger's people. Like it's really hard to be an incredibly good J70 Helms person because of the amount of focus that you have to have. You just, you can't be distracted by all the stuff that normally a Helms person likes to take in as inputs. It's about keeping the boat at the same angle of the heel all the time. You need a Helms person who's got a, a good sensitivity on the helm, can feel when the boat's talking to them through the rudder through the tiller extension and also has a good sense of heel angle through their hips um, and the ability to focus. That's the physical requirement of a good helms person. How does the helm feel needs to be a question that is implied. It needs to be verbal. And so the helms person is talking about that. They don't know where they are in the race course. All they're talking about is load. Then as we come in to the windward mark, right, the rolls get divided and there's a couple of different ways to skin the cat, but generally speaking, your jib trimmer, who is probably already actively trimming the jib, is gonna go to leeward and they're gonna help feeding the, the tack of the spinnaker out. Okay. Just getting the, the tongue out. The big guy is gonna stay on the rail because we want him hiking the boat flat as we come around the weather mark. Okay. Right? 
From there, he's behind his back pulling the tack line to the tack line pre-feed mark, okay. which should be essentially where the tack arrives about an inch above the end of the pole at full extension. But he's doing that from the rail. And then as we bear away and come down to the offset mark, if the, the course is set square, we shouldn't be able to set on the offset leg. But as we get to the offset mark and start to bear away, now the lured person who was your jib trimmer grabs the spinnaker halyard and hoists. The guy who's on the weather rail, the, your, who will be your spinnaker trimmer, comes legs in and he pulls the pole out. That takes the tack out to full extension. And in the perfect set, the head and the pole terminate at the same moment so that the kite goes flump and fills, All right? The mainsail trimmer does the initial trim on the spinnaker sheet to fill the kite, hands it forward to the spinnaker trimmer who's keeping his body weight up there. The driver's got to sail the perfect angle. Right. And if he's got his, the main in his hand, he's often thinking about the main sheet. So yeah. the mainsail trimmer probably put the main in the right spot and then grabbed the kite sheet. You can be fairly late on trimming the kite sheet because if you're early, neither end will make it to its final terminus. It sort of initially luffs and then we trim to proper position. If it's over trimmed, it's really hard to get it to run out and get there. So you're a little sluggish on the acceleration. The boat should feel like the candle got lit and the afterburners are on um, out of the spinnaker set. If the boat doesn't seem to accelerate, you were probably over trimmed on the kite initially. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the, the forward person then takes the sheet from the mainsail trimmer and starts trimming. The, the jib trimmer furls the jib, um, and that can be a casual furl in most cases if the helps person has sailed the proper angle, even in light air. Um, in heavy air, it stays out, and they remain trimming that. If we're in planing conditions and your tactician will have, will have called the mode off of the offset on approach to the weather mark, they will say defending high, defending low, straight set, and then they'll also declare the mode. We're either going wing, we're planing, or VMG. Those are your three options. They'll have made that call on approach to the weather mark. So if we're, if we're uh, planing, the jib never goes away. It has to initially get eased enough so the upper half luffs for the kite to fill. Otherwise, it takes forever for the kite to get going. But then once that happens, we should trim on until the top is just soft and then we, we go ripping and it, it's, a, it's a big performance boost to have it out. Um, when we go to jibe though, we always furl the jib. Furl the jib, you jibe, and then you redeploy. There are times, especially if the course isn't set square, where you can do a lazy plane at say 12, and there, if it's a high lazy plane, the jib is also very beneficial. Most lazy planing is jib furled and we're doing like 7.8 to 8.1. Um, at 14, we're doing nine and change and, and ripping it. Thinking about modes and thinking about my experience watching you guys, uh, I did a Thursday night two weeks ago where I sailed with Jib Edwards uh, on 56. We came around the okay. top mark. You guys were just in front of us. You guys sailed high, we sailed low. And then when you jive back, we had you by about two boat lengths. So it's still a J boat. So when you've got pressure, you want to send it low, but you can't let the boat stand up. So if you've got nine knots of breeze, go to the wing, step down a ladder rung, let the guys play across, then jive back. Now you're inside them and you just match them all the way downwind. If there's a whole parade, let's say you had a bad set and there's a parade of boats that are gonna go over the top of you, you jive, clear your air and come back. The high lane is sort of like around the leeward mark, trying to foot low, thinking you're gonna get clear and recover. The guys who went slow and went high are gonna beat you to the weather mark. I mean. It, Unfortunately, just the math of the geometry doesn't work. The boat will never create enough speed to overcome the extra distance sail. You'd be better off as soon as you got high and the boat behind you committed low, you could come back down and smother them. And well, if we had instrumentation on the boat, it'd be 140 TWA almost all the time. <laughs> like that's just sort of the magic number. But from a, we don't have that. So from a, a, a feel standpoint, one, you should feel a little apparent wind in the boat. The boat should be flat or slightly leeward heeled. And even a few degrees leeward heel is probably eight to 10. Like as soon as you notice it's leeward heel, it's more than you think. So you'll notice a lot of guys have instrumentation on their boat. They either have the Varicose Atlas, and that's because we've learned that 
heel is like, it's the magic thing. Keeping the boat pressurized. And it's, and, and it's on your spinnaker trimmer. It's not a, downwind is not a helmsman's game. There's nothing he can do really. Um, that's the place to pin it and then use your body weight to drive downwind. If the spinnaker trimmer can't sense when the kite is loaded enough to, to take a bite to leeward, um, then you'll have trouble making your way downwind. And a bite to leeward is that your jib trimmer does this. The helm doesn't move. The, the jib trimmer shifts his shoulders to windward and the boat just scoots down. It's mostly kinetics to get the boat downwind and that's something very much worth working on. Cool thing is, is this boat rewards smooth more than it rewards frenetic. You don't have to be a high school 420 sailor to get the boat to do magic. You need to be smart and just place your weight in the right spot and be patient and the boat will react. Cool. They're incredibly weight sensitive. Driving.